Anyone who was anywhere near the Great Lakes this summer saw the dramatic change compared to the last few years. Flooding, record high lake levels and colder temperatures all made it next to impossible not to appreciate how critical the lakes are and what a substantial change in them due to global warming could mean to this province. Joining us now with some considerable expertise on the matter, David Phillips, Senior Climatologist at Environment and Climate Change Canada, and Gail Kranzberg, Professor and Director of the Engineering and Public Policy Program at McMaster University in Hamilton. And it's great to have you two back on our program. David, Thank it's been a while Steve. for you. It has, Steve. I'm glad I'm you're back glad there. To be back. You've been a more recent uh, familiar face around here lately, for which we're grateful. So I want to go to you first. As we, I'm going to make you the doctor, and your patients are the five Great Lakes, and you're doing a checkup. Give us a sense of how each of the patients is doing right now. Well, let's start at the top and work our way down. Okay. Superior is always performing superior. <laughs> superior is in very good shape. Um, all of the lakes have the same virus, if you will. They all have invasive species, but I'll get to that in a minute. But by and large, the population density in Lake Superior is lower, the pollution is lower, the temperatures are rising more. It has a temperature. Maybe David could talk about that. Climate change is, is increasing the temperature in Lake Superior more than in the other Great Lakes. And that could have implications for the fish and the wildlife and even mm. human health. If we go down now into Michigan and Huron, which are sort of connected, Michigan is entirely on the U.S. side. Michigan, um, Michigan needs some serious medicine. Michigan has serious problems with nutrient enrichment, nuisance algal blooms, which I'll talk about more because we have a worse patient when it comes to that. Um, and it has legacy pollutants, industrial pollutants, like in the bottom, at, at the sediment at the bottom of the lake that are costing billions of dollars to clean up because those contaminants can get into the food chain and affect the wildlife, but also affect us if we wanted to eat those fish, for example. So are we talking serious condition, critical condition? What are we thinking? Um, it's a time judgment. If you looked to where they were 50 years ago, they're getting better. Hmm. But they're still in a difficult situation. Okay. They're still not healthy. Lake Huron. Lake Huron is a little bit healthier than Michigan. It's a little less populated, except for Saginaw Bay, which is down in the southwest corner, which is very industrial. Um, it's starting to have problems um, like teenagers. It sort of like has the acne of algae. <laughs> like like it, everybody else was fine, and now all of a sudden the populations are growing there, septic systems are growing there. The runoff from agricultural fields are now starting to put more nutrients into Lake Huron and they're starting to have some problems with nuisance algae, which is really a shame because it was, it was quite a pristine place about 20 years ago and now it's sort of declining on that realm. If you go down to Lake Erie, we have a very ill patient. This one should probably be in critical care. Hmm. Um, it is really the one suffering the most from harmful algal blooms. These are the algae that are, well, they're called blue-green algae. They're actually kind of bacteria. They're called cyanobacteria. They create poisons, cyanotoxins in the water. People might remember Toledo, four, three years ago, had to shut down its drinking water supply because these blooms were creating these toxins that drinking water systems can't treat. And those pollutants can actually kill animals. If you let your dog walk into the, into the lake where you have an algal bloom like that, your dog could die from it. So this, this, so there's a very concerted effort to bring Lake Erie back to health and reduce the nutrient pollution, much of which is coming from agricultural runoff, but some of which is coming from wastewater treatment plants as well. I remember swimming in Erie last summer and thinking I was in a bowl of soup. Yeah. It just was, it was thick and hot, and I just thought this is not a great lake that I remember from my childhood. No, it's much. Well, you know, Lake Erie's gone in in two directions. In the 60s and 70s, one of the reasons why the two governments of Canada and the United States signed an accord to protect the Great Lakes was because Lake Erie was dying. Algal, algal blooms, lack of oxygen when they decompose, fish kills all over the place. And then Lake Erie came back to health because we spent a lot of money on good engineering to control the phosphorus. Things have changed. Mm. We now have zebra mussels that are making the nutrients move around in weird ways. And we have more agricultural intensity. And so it's no longer an engineer fixing the sewage treatment plant. Now it's a more complicated issue. And a lot of scientists and a lot of government people are spending a lot of time figuring out how to bring Lake Erie back to mm. health. Okay, Doctor, Lake Ontario. Let's finish on that. Lake Ontario it has a temperature. <laughs> um, uh, it's not as sick as Lake Erie. Uh, it's probably a little bit more ill than Huron. It is a bit more ill than Huron. 
It's starting to go the way of Lake Erie in terms of the nutrient enrichment, but it also has a big problem with invasive species. All of the lakes, except parts, most of Lake Superior, all of the lakes have a legacy of contamination in them. But what we're really worried about right now are the things that are happening near shore where people are, and populations are growing in all of the Great Lakes. Not so much in Superior, but all the Great Lakes, which means all the things that you and I use and pour down the drain are going into the lakes like microbeads, microplastics, personal care products, things that have endocrine disrupting properties. And those will just start to increase as more people grow and use those products because our sewage plants can't take those out. So we're finding in Lake Ontario, this is not a pretty sight, but we're finding male fish with ovaries. That's certainly the canary in the, in the, in the cage telling us things yeah. are not well. From your vantage point, what would you add to that list of things? Maybe, I don't know, if you want to pick up on the temperature of the Great Lakes um, and, and the impact climate change is having on that. Well, we certainly know they stick a thermometer in the Great Lakes and it is showing fever. Uh, we're seeing it uh, clearly, particularly in the summertime. I mean, the lakes do uh, cool off to the winter where you can get still get ice on them. Uh, but um, I would add about the lake levels. I mean, that has been a, a very... We've been monitoring lake levels for almost 100 years, back in 1918. So we've got good records on the highs and the lows with regards to the records. And what we have seen in recent years, Steve, is, um, is something we haven't seen before. The change from low levels to high levels almost in record time. Uh, I remember in January of 2013, uh, Lake Huron, for example, was at its lowest level ever. And within two short years, it really bounced right up to where it was now above normal. So it almost increased in 23 months of one meter. I mean, that is just something we've never seen before. So a lot of people are talking about the fact that, hey, what climate change is going to do is to make Great Lakes uh, levels lower. I mean, they're talking about sea levels rising, but freshwater lakes are likely to go down. And I think that there is a lot of truth to that. But my sense is that it'll be the variability, the wild swings where you go from high levels to low levels. And we all want balance in life. We want balance in weather. And we want balance in, in Great Lakes levels. And we've seen the economic, social implications from those changing water levels, from whether it be energy production or shipping or seeing your beach this, this width or that width. Um, it is having all kinds. Nobody's left out on the, on the changes that are taking place in the Great Lakes. But let me understand if this is good or bad, because I know for, for probably the last decade, I've been hearing people all over the province in cottage country during the summer say, oh my goodness, the, the, the lake levels are so low right now, it's killing tourism, it's a problem for everything. And then this past summer, you're quite right, the levels were way up. I thought that's what people wanted. But it also killed tourism. I mean, look at Toronto Islands. I mean, they mm -hmm. had actually, I mean, 40% of the islands were, were inundated with uh, the fact that Lake Ontario had reached one of its highest levels, whether on record or in decades. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a kill of the, of the, the economic tourism here in the, in the Toronto area. And it was a, from a social, econo you know, from a psychological point of view, it was really for city folk. It was one of their favorite little vacation places. Absolutely. It was the Muskoka for, for Toronto residents in mm -hmm. some cases. And so they were denied that opportunity. As I say, you like kind of balance. And when they wild swings, there are winners and losers. But I think everybody wins when you can have constant lake levels. Doesn't sound like we're going to be having balance going forward. So who are the winners and who are the losers when the lake levels keep going up or down so dramatically? The winners are the wetlands. Wetlands love it. They like to dry out and they like to flood, get completely submerged, dry out again. That's what keeps them vital. So the wetlands are the winners. And if the wetlands are the winners, our fish and wildlife are the winners. People who live in the floodplain, they're the losers. And we should have never put them in the, there in the first place. As they found out in Houston. Yes, and in Windsor. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're living in an area that was prone to flooding, or actually an area that used to be underwater that's now built up to be above water, like the Gardner Expressway, by the way, that used to be a wetland or underwater. Those are the losers because you can't predict, as David said, you can't predict how far away the water will be. So if you're on the shore and you have a marina, now you can't get into your boat because it's, it's in dry land, or you're completely washed out. So the extremes are the, the losers are the people on the extremes. Let me pick up on that notion of predictions because it seems to me, and I know, you know, from, from watching your work, 
You've been astonished at the kind of predictive ability meteorologists have been making, particularly in the United States, as these, as Storm H and Storm I have, I learned that this week, eh? It's alphabetical, that's how it goes. As Harvey and Irma have, have wreaked their havoc, uh, they saw it coming, didn't they? They did. Steve, yeah. I, I think it's amazing we can put a man on the moon and we can also sometimes get the weather right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was almost this Hurricane Irma particularly. Mm -hmm. It was almost as if it was scripted, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it was like on a, on a GPS. And then at the end, it heard this message. Um, uh, 50 kilometers, turn right. <laughs> and it turned right, right into Florida. And the only mystery of this from 10 days before because the, the forecasters at the, uh, in Miami said uh, that on the weekend, this past weekend, it will be a major hurricane that strikes Florida. The only question was, will it be on the west coast, the east coast, or up the spine of Florida? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as we know at the end, it wiggled and it wobbled and it went up the west coast and then it fortunately moved inland because it cut off its uh, energy from the ocean and so it was less of a blow in northern uh, state. But nobody was left out in the cold on this one. Mm -hmm. It affected the whole state. But the but, point is, think of all the lives that were saved because these oh, folks were able to do their truly, job so well. Exactly, and not just in the United States but in the Caribbean. I mean, 20 years ago, the death count, instead of 30 or 35, sadly, in the Caribbean, it would have been hundreds or hundreds or, or thousands. Mm -hmm. I remember I, I was alive when there was a hurricane that hit Bangladesh in 17, 1970, and there were over 200,000 people that died in that, that cyclone. Well, in fact, now there'd be a royal commission set up if, if, if a handful of people died. It's because we have better forecasting services, we have better preparedness in terms of our emergency measures people, they take this seriously, people do, most people do pay attention, and also we've done better in terms of, in some areas, not necessarily in Houston, but certainly in Florida, because they've been hit before, mm -hmm. they have actually understood that and have built buildings stronger so they can withstand the force of Mother Nature. Not, not totally, but they can certainly uh, weather the storm in, in many cases. And that's the future, isn't it? Under, understanding that we can now forecast these things more accurately, let's build infrastructure around here that can handle this, eh? Exactly, Steve. You know, it's not the same weather that our parents and grandparents had to deal with. I mean, they did well with the infrastructure that they built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They paid a lot more money on infrastructure than we pay now. And they, were, they weren't immune from these systems, but they certainly didn't have the kind of, uh, of massive storms that we're seeing now. And I think we've got to pay attention to that. Our climate has changed. So therefore, the way in which we deal with it in terms of the infrastructure also has to change. And if we do it at the beginning, we're far better off. When you build a, a certain pipe at the beginning of a development, it doesn't it costs a few more pennies to make it, say, you know, 30 centimeters wide instead of 10 centimeters wide. And it clearly does protect you from, uh, from those storms of the past. One little thing that I'm just amazed at, if you, in building a roof, in Ontario, for example. The building code says, put nails in every 12 centimeters, or every 12 inches, a foot. If you put them in six inches, you double the strength of that roof. What does it cost for a more handful of nails? So a lot of times they're not big ticket items, they're just logical, it makes sense, and I think if the politicians and the policy people can in fact understand that and move to that, I think we'll, we'll have a have a, we'll have a more resilient uh, community and we'll be much better off, of course. That makes so much abundant sense. I remember covering the Barry Tornado 32 years ago now, and how many roofs of houses were ripped right off just because of what you've just said, well, inadequate and, and Exactly, and Steve, in some cases, when they examined that, that debris, mm -hmm. they found that some homes were not built to code. Hmm. And in a tornado just about three years ago in... Uh, in, in um, was it Angus, uh, the tornado there, when those roof trusts were laying on the ground and the engineers from the University of Western Ontario looked at them, they realized that they were not built to code. So mm. not only do we have to inspect what we do, but we have to increase the, the, the strength of our building codes to make sure that we have a safer community. Gail, we all know that we get our drinking water out of the Great Lakes, but I want you to sort of describe the Great Lakes uh, from an economic point of view. If they were a country, how big would the economy be? Oh, very interesting question. So if you consider the eight Great Lakes states in the province of Ontario and Quebec to be a nation state, one nation state, 
they would be about the third largest economy in the world, hmm. um, and with one twelfth the population of the net uh, of, of a nation state in the world. So the the economy in the Great Lakes region is massive. It's it accounts for approximately half the GDP in Canada alone. Um, and then the, this is one point that is, has always fascinated me when when we talk with our federal colleagues about what are the investments in Great Lakes, they talk about, well, we need to think about national programs. We are the federal government, and that's a regional issue. And I don't know if half the GDP <laughs> is, is a regional issue. To me, that's a, it's a national treasure. So the economy of the region is massive. It's based on, well, many of the industries have, have located here because of the access to water. Even, even our recreational fishing industry is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. I mean, it's astonishing. What, uh, just picking up on David's last answer, if, if you could change something about the way we behave or the way we build or the way we do infrastructure as it relates to the Great Lakes, to make us, I guess, in part, more prepared for climate change or more prepared for natural disasters, what's on your wish list? So there are a few things. Um, one of the things we saw in the massive storm this May was the release of raw sewage from Toronto into the Great Lakes and other cities as well, right around Lake Ontario. Because when the sewer system can't handle that much water... So we have in, yeah. in the city, for example, in the city of Toronto, we have our storm sewers and our waste sewers coming from our homes, in some place, cases, combined, and they go to the sewage treatment plant, which is designed for a certain amount of flow. And if it's going to be exceeded, they've got to divert that or it's going to wash out all the sewage. So we get raw sewage, and we get those 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 combined sewers. They purposely overflow, so we get partial partial sewage going into the lakes. Mm -hmm. Detention ponds, underground storage tanks. We have some of them. We put one in. The city of Toronto put one in around Cherry Beach, maybe 20 years ago. Cherry Beach, can, you can swim in it now, hmm. right? Because if there's a combined sewer that's going to overflow, it goes into this containment underground instead of in Lake Ontario instead of Lake Ontario the solids which have all the gooky stuff they settle out and then you can treat the water and put it back into lakes is, safely uh, gooky stuff a technical term in it's your business it's very scientific it is yeah, i thought so yeah. um, <laughs> the other thing that we but the on the other side i think soft engineering is 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 really imperative um, if you if we could get the water to go back into the ground that's where that's where it wants to go the reason that we got that massive disaster in may is that not only did we overflow our sewage treatment plants and, and the, the lake levels rise, the water had nowhere to go. The ground was already saturated and everything else is paved over. So where is it going to go? So if we retrofit many of our pavement to be porous and allow the water to go through, I'm not talking about our highways, but maybe all of our parking lots, if we captured the rain coming off our roofs and used that for irrigation, let's consider stormwater as an asset not as something that we want to get out as fast as possible and then flood the system and put raw sewage into the system and erode the banks and then wash out our wetlands. Let's char start talking about soft engineering, low impact development, things like bioswales. Doesn't that sound better what, than... What's a bioswale? Sounds better than icky stuff, right? <laughs> a bioswale would be a buffer strip, maybe with a ditch, on the edge of a parking lot where the water, instead of going into a stream, goes into that ditch, gets absorbed by the plants. The plants stop the oh. particles from going in, and the water that goes out is clean. Brilliant. And it's inexpensive. Yeah. So there's lots of soft technology that we need to start thinking about. It's not so easy to retrofit a city like Toronto, but anytime you're going to start putting in any new development, these permeable elements, rainwater harvesting, getting the lot-based you know, at, at a lot level base, getting that water to go down into the ground, that would be, along, along with those detention tanks, which are multi-million dollars, mm -hmm. that would be m another absolute must. And I presume this is important because the, the climate is changing in such a way, it seems inexorably, over the next couple of 20, 30 years, to the point where Ontario's weather is going to look like what by the year 2050, David? What do you think? Well, I mean, we, we often look southward. We say it will be the climate of Kentucky now. And people, they say to me, oh, bluegrass, that seems so <laughs> inviting. I say, well, just wait. Um, you know, uh, think about Kentucky. It gets uh, more Category 5 hurricane, uh, tornadoes than any other state in the Union mm -hmm. per capita, and also five times the number of hailstorms. That, that Ontario gets. Well, we don't want that here. We, exactly. We've never had a Category 5 
tornado. If he, one hit your home, you'd have to walk back and forth three times to see if you ever lived there because the petals wouldn't be on the flowers and the asphalt would be in another county. Oh my goodness. So that it is, um, so, so, but I mean, there are some, let me put it, there's some maybe things that we could look forward to. I mean, we might be able to grow uh, crops that we uh, would only dream of before and farmers are way ahead of, the, of that. They, they will take the risk of, uh, putting in certain Australian grapes, for example, or peanuts or um, okra. Uh, uh, so there are things, even people are trying soybeans up in the clay belt of Ontario. Hmm. Not always successfully, but so, you know, there are some, some, some winners in, in terms of it warming up. But I think my concern is that I think um, we haven't seen at all what Mother Nature is going to produce here and, 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 and that we're amplifying it up. I think our motivation for doing something about it is based not on what we've seen, um, based on what we're going to see. Hmm. And uh, we can't even handle the climate we've got now than the climate we're going to get. And I think that we need to understand that and begin to prepare it for. And as Gail said, these are not big ticket items. Well, that's what I was going to say. Add to your list, because you talked to us already about simple stuff like nails and roofs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, she's talked about storm sewers having ex you know, additional capacity and so on. What would you add to the list? Well, my wish would be the fact that everybody would embrace this and feel that they have a responsibility. We all created the issue, so therefore we're all part of the solution. And just don't think, every time that Mother Nature misbehaves, you think that the federal and provincial government are gonna bail you out. It's up to the individual home and the neighborhood to do things that to protect your family and your neighborhood from the ravages of, um, uh, of climate change. We in Canada, we're, we're strong at adapting. You know, it's been our, our history as a country. We've been dealt tough weather in this country, and yet we've adapted to it, and we've not only have we survived, but we've thrived. And I think the challenge for us is to continue to do that, to do things around the home, to protect your home against the ravages of, uh, of, of, of climate or weather changes, and make sure the municipalities do, and to make sure that the people you elect also understand that. And I, I, I'm optimistic because what I see is a really a change by people who are in position of decision making mm -hmm. understand that this is something that they have to, they're responsible for. And that what we're, we're, we're seeing is that people are getting by this idea, Steve, that hey, we, we clean up, we bail and bag, and we get ready for the next flood. Mm -hmm. But why not build something more resilient at the beginning so that you're not having those photo opportunities of bailing and bagging when the, <laughs> when the flood season comes. And so I think that people are realizing that if you spend more millions now, you'll save billions in the future. Do you think, Gail, that political leaders are seized enough of this issue to make the kind of changes that you two have been recommending here? Actually, I do. Um, well, I have a great colleague. Uh, he actually visited your show uh, from Chicago um, with the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, mm -hmm. which is an alliance of, of well over 100 mayors representing the cities around cities, towns, villages around the Great Lakes. And they've put forward resolutions about climate change adaptation strategies that they need to move forward. They need to look at, at progressive ways to retrofit their communities so that they're more resilient. I mean, no mayor wants the city to be bailing out people who, uh, whose basements are full of sewage or, or, or people in hospital because of un, undrinkable water. So I think the political wisdom is out there. They're seeing the, they're, they are seeing uh, the need for this. That's at the local level. How about in the White House? Well, I think there might be differences of opinion in the White House. That's gingerly putting it. Uh, yes, I think I think there are some. I'm, I'm certain there. I know there are certain political leaders in the U.S. that definitely believe that 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 climate change is human induced. That we need to do something about it, rather than that it's a conspiracy from some other, I don't know, say planet. I don't know. I'll be gentle there. Mm -hmm. um, look, whatever the political leader might say. It's the people who are actually doing things that'll make things happen. So for example, we may have a, 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 a president who believes certain things, and yet governors will go forward and do what they believe is right for their people. Well, in fact, he tried to gut the EPA, and uh, I mean, he, he still may, but I think you were here a year ago talking about the Great Lakes initiatives, and Trump was gonna cut the budget to all of that, but Congress reinstated it, I think, did they That's not? That's right. The governors of the Great Lakes states understand the value of the Great Lakes ecosystem for the economy of the region. And when the president was proposing to cut the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative 
300 million a year for a multi-billion dollar economy, by the way, the governors and Senate and Congress said no. Um, so, so the minds that, that understand the value of the Great Lakes region, um, the politicians who live in the Great Lakes region, will do the right thing. Hmm. It's, it's, in their, it's in their economic interest, along with the, with the societal interest, hmm. environmental interest, but it's in the economic interest. Yeah, in our last few minutes here, I want to get one last uh, comment from each of you on, because this has been an extraordinary last four weeks or so, uh, first with Harvey and now with Irma, and I'm not sure that we've ever seen in our lifetimes this much devastation in such close proximity to one another, uh, wreaking so much havoc. I mean, yes, there was Katrina, but that was, that was one, that was one storm. This is two. And I want to know, David, what lessons there are for us from what you've been watching south of the border. Well, I think, Steve, we can't, I, I think we shouldn't say that this is clearly climate change. I mean, you have storms, it may be just something very inelegant that it might be weren't bad these, luck. Weren't these two once in a thousand year storms happening in the same month? That's right. And you add to that the uh, firestorms in California. I mean, the United States gets more severe weather than any other nation on Earth. Huh. And what we're seeing in the last uh, three weeks is, uh, is a good example of that. But certainly we know that, uh, like for example, hurricanes, we, there's a sense that um, we're seeing more powerful ones. Mm. Uh, we're not seeing the more numbers around the world. And, but the thing is 90% of the damage from hurricanes come from 10% of the storms. It's the big ones mm. that do you in. So what do we need to know? Well, I think what we need to know is the fact that um, we, we, can, we just can't sit there and grin and bear it and say, okay, Mother Nature's going to get us. I think that what we need to do is to feel that we should build up our infrastructure to be able to withstand it. We can't, you can't prevent the hazard from coming, blowing your way, but you can prevent it from becoming a natural disaster. We call them natural disasters. Steve, I've never met a natural disaster that didn't have some human DNA to it. Hmm. And I think that what we need to do is recognize that this is not something that we can wait for, for the future generations. It's something, it's the here and now, and we have to get on with it. Lessons for the Great Lakes from Harvey and Irma? Oh, certainly. Um, the question is, can it happen here? Well, it's not going to be blowing off the ocean, but certainly we've seen it here. We've seen the massive flooding here. And, and I think David makes the point. Um, we need to build for resilience. We need to recognize that this is going to happen. Let's not, be, let's not assume we're just going to be lucky. This is going to happen. We will continue to get lake levels going all over the place. Let's change the way that we view what was and look into the future and figure out how are we going to become more resilient, how are we going to adapt our businesses, our industries, our infrastructure, our cities, our towns, our individual behaviors to be resilient to these kinds of change in climate. And, uh, and I, I, it is doable. And I think one of the things that's really important is that people, if they're concerned, talk to their politicians, tell them how concerned they are, and make it a priority for investment in their community. I note with interest, and we just had him on the program, uh, Toronto has hired a new chief resilience officer oh. whose job it is to basically deal with all of the issues. I mean, this is his mission, to deal with all of the issues that you two have put on the table today and figure out how the cities are going to move forward in doing them. And there's a list of 100 cities around the world that have apparently joined this initiative to, to add resilience. It's something they may know of, but I'm not sure people in their everyday lives realize that they have a role to play on that. Do you think they do? Well, I do. I think that it, it really, it's, it starts with a family unit. And I, I'm, I, I feel that it's not something that just because you buy insurance doesn't necessarily mean that you should feel uh, a, not a responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. And because you pay taxes, you shouldn't feel that necessarily you should be bailed out every time that, that, that weather, extreme weather comes. But I have, I've met uh, councillors and mayors who feel this, Steve. They feel, well, we were hit once. I mean, lightning never hits strikes twice in the same. I said, well, you know, something about your area that maybe attracts lightning, do you say? <laughs> okay. So, um, but I, I sense the people I talk to realize that what has changed is the weather has changed, not climate. Mm -hmm. Climate is sort of something that is measured in centuries or, or the other side of the world. But when you can tell people that your weather, your day-to-day -day weather, the stuff that you dress Johnny or Marie more warmly to go to school has changed, then I think they wake up and they feel that there is a responsibility there. 
and I think that there is the, the, the climate is right for these people to begin to move, and they're just looking for leadership. And I think the leadership comes from the, uh, hopefully, the, the, the elected officials. See, this is why we wanted you two here. You guys know stuff. That's why we're happy to have you here today. Gail Kranzberg from McMaster University, David Phillips, Environment Canada and Climate Change. Really good of both of you to spend so much time with us here on TVO tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.